Folks, please keep these prayer requests coming. Do not tire of putting this forward to our God. Our God is real. He is great. He is greater than anything um, out there that's telling you it's it's got you under its thumb. No, not so. Not so. Pastor Mazigugo, I'm going to ask you to um, unmute yourself and uh, turn on your camera if it's possible. Are you here, Pastor Ketelo? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes, oh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, listen, where, where does, uh, where does uh, 25 minutes to 12 p.m. in South Africa find you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, by God's grace, I have my electricity back, so that's a good thing. Um, we were praying for you when it was off. Ask the people who are here early, we prayed, and God is I, I Thank you for the prayers, and I, I hope uh, Pastor Masankate also has it back. Uh, I know Matthews it was. Somewhere. Yes, I know it was him, me, and um, I think another colleague from Zambia. We lost yes, power this Masa. evening. Yeah. Yes. So I. I surprise! I, I surprise! Ne? Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> this enemy I, thinks, I, he thinks he thinks he thinks he thinks he thinks he knows a thing or two. Ah, uh, that guy. You know, I even asked Pastor Ramasankate if we are all provided power by the same company because uh, it just went down all at the same time. But we are grateful to God that we are here. We are grateful for this season of prayer. Yeah. And um, what a very encouraging and powerful way to start this year mm -hmm. um, uh, as we present ourselves in prayer to God. Absolutely. And what's God has, what has God put on your heart? It's the beginning of the year. I see your family is in the frame behind you. Um, you've been hearing the prayers of the people as, and uh, you've heard some of what has been shared already. What's God has on your heart for you? What does God have on your heart? Well, this evening, um, what I would like to speak on very briefly is hope in adversity. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we are going through what could be a culmination. Um, you know, for some people, COVID-19 came and finished mm -hmm. the last reserves of strength that they had. For some people, prior to COVID-19, life was great. And so the energy to fight is still there. Mm -hmm. But for some people, this is just the climaxing of what has been a long 5, 10, or even 15 in this evening is what? What do we do um, with hope in, mm -hmm. in, in a situation such as this, especially when hope is dwindling? Yeah, in fact, I think the world beyond, you know, you know Christendom, beyond this, this um, body of Christ, would suggest that some of us are naive to believe that there's any reason to hope in anything. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So we look forward to hearing what God has in your heart. I know that's not much for pastors, um, but may God uh, help you economize and uh, deliver uh, what is needed for these times. God bless. Thank you. And I want to greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The text that I'd like to share belongs to one of a series of texts that are very um, dear to me and certainly speak to some of the uh, uh, things that God has asked me to address in ministry and in my life. It's just one verse, but for me, it packs a big punch. Proverbs chapter 13, verse um, 12. Proverbs 13, verse 12. And this is all that it says. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Let's pray on that text. Father, we thank you for your wisdom and your guidance so far. Thank you for your men servants who have expounded on your word and have encouraged us. Thank you for the prayers that have been offered and have been answered in heaven. Now we pray that you continue to enlighten us and give us revelation of your word. Through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, hope is something very fascinating. As I looked at hope, I found that hope is the ability, has this ability first and foremost, that hope paints for us the final outcome. Hope paints the end all the time. 
if you, for example, are going to um, start schooling on your first year of university, you know what hope does? On day one, hope shows you walking down uh, the, the aisle with your, with your honors degree or your master's degree or your PhD. That is what hope does. Hope always paints the final picture. When you meet the girl of your dreams or the boy of your dreams and, and you, you decide that you want to get married, hope immediately shows you the true of you retiring in old age somewhere around the beautiful beaches of Cape Town or Durban and enjoying your grandchildren visiting you on holidays. That is what hope does. When we buy a house, for example, hope shows you uh, uh, this house that is now in your name and the title deeds have been given over to you and you've even renovated it and made it bigger than what it looks now. The thing about hope is hope never tells us the story of what happens between now and then. Hope never tells us about the difficult journey that we need to travel in order to get to that point where what we are dreaming about is going to become real. Hope doesn't tell us the details. If you are going to get married, hope doesn't tell you about the fights. Hope doesn't tell you about the cheating. Hope doesn't tell you that sometimes you'll go broke. Hope doesn't tell you about the times when you will be uh, evicted from uh, where you were renting. Hope doesn't tell you when you're, that you are going to get retrenched. When you start school, hope doesn't tell you that you will run out of money and you will be chased out of university. Hope doesn't tell you that you are going to be studying taxation or accounting and from there you are going to fail some of the courses that you were studying. Hope doesn't tell you all of those things. When you want to have children, hope doesn't tell you that your child might be born with autism, that your child might be born disabled, that when your child is a teenager, they are going to go into drugs, or that when your child is a teenager, they will tell you that uh, mom or dad, I think I'm gay. Hope never what the end will look like. And as life begins, with each and every day we begin to discover that what is hoped for is not coming as fast as we thought it would. You know, a good example um, of that is when you are buying a house, for example, at the back of our minds, without us saying it, when you're buying a house or you're buying a car, you don't actually see yourself paying a bond for 20 years. Somewhere at the back of your mind, you see yourself succeeding in some businesses here and there. And suddenly you walk up to the bank and you say, oh, here's the rest of your money in just five years, bond done, paid off. That is the nature of hope. And hope is well to do that, to not tell us the in-betweens. Because if hope told us the in-betweens, many of us would not have even started the journey itself. Now, in the Bible, there are characters that I love, characters that are very dear to me because they seem to have displayed what we would call a lack of faith. And yet God honored them. He honored them for the genuineness of how they walked with him. Characters like Job. When you read Job chapter 9, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, when Job says, God is a bully. God is a big bully. I can't even question him about what he's doing in my life. I'm a mere mortal. Even when I try to question him, he will show up in thunder and might, and I will not have a voice. When characters like Moses would say to God, no, you can't take us out of Egypt and kill us in the wilderness. What will the people say? See, these are people who struggled with faith and hope. 
And when their faith and their hope had reached a stage of confusion about what God was doing, they didn't pretend to understand. They went to him and they said, I don't get you. And I am running out of power. I am running out of strength. I am running out of patience. I am running out of hope. I am exhausted. I have been praying. I have been crying. You have not been answering. And that is why Solomon says, Hey, let me tell you the truth. There is a time when hope is delayed. And every time hope is delayed, the heart gets sick. The heart gets poisoned. The heart gives up. And what Solomon was writing for, Solomon was writing for those people who are saying, I don't have enough anymore left in me to be a Christian. I don't have enough left in me to wake up and go to church anymore. So you will excuse me this evening, but I'm not here to pray for those of you who still know the coordinations to your faith. For those of you who the GPS of your travel with God is still beeping right. I and Solomon have been sent by the Holy Spirit to talk to those of you, to those of us who are in this group, who are saying, Lord, I am at the end. I'm not doing this anymore. I've prayed. I have fasted. I have fought a good fight, but the results have not come. What more should I do? I'm here to talk to those who perhaps like me grew up in poverty, who have never known a life of plenty, that from the beginning we've been fighting. When we left our mother's wombs, we were fighting. When we grew up, we were fighting. I can understand those perhaps who started the fight somewhere in their adulthood, but there are some of us who've been fighting from day one. And Solomon says, I know what you are talking about. You have reached a stage where to be hopeful seems like poison, where you just cannot do it anymore. And Solomon says, for you and I, we don't need a prayer for more strength. What does Solomon say in the second line? He says, now we want our desires to become a tree of life. In other words, we are not at that place where we are still willing to walk a long journey. Some can still do that. There are those whose faith can really still do that. They can still walk another 10 years with God. But some started this journey of fighting 20 years ago. They don't have 10 more years to give. And Solomon says, you and I, you and I must come to God this evening and say, tonight, let the desires of my heart become a living tree, a tree of life. Because I'm not there yet. I'm not there where I can still give you another 10 years, God. I'm not undermining my faith. I'm not undermining you. I am a Job of my times. I am a Moses of my times. I don't have the energy. I don't have it anymore. My mental health has broken. I look insane, though I am sane. I look like I am crazy, though I am not. Because I have fought, I have given my all, I have nothing more. Give me deliverance. Give me deliverance, mighty God. And that is what I've come to pray for this evening. Because the Bible tells me, as God did it with Moses and with Job, God does hear such prayers. God does not only hear those who want strength to move on. God hears also those who are saying, I don't have enough. I don't. I don't have another year of praying. I don't have another three years of trying to make this marriage work. I have tried for the past 17 years. I've been sick for the past 20 years. I have been poor for the past 30 years. And that's why I'm saying, dear friends, yes. 
We want to pray for COVID, but perhaps COVID is, is a later challenge that has met many of us now. But for some of us, it is a climax of a long problem. And we are here at the COVID-19 stage saying to God, enough of what I have. I don't have any more. Deliver us, almighty God. Deliver us. Because we are sick. Our hearts are sick. We have hoped as far as hope could hope. Now we need our hope to become a tree of life. Do you know what God did for Job who was tired? In the end, he restored him and gave him everything. Do you know what God did for Moses who was exhausted in chapter 33? Who was no longer willing to go on? God said, I will show you my glory. So my Bible teaches me that God honors those who have reached the end. If you've got strength to move on for another three, four years, may God be with you. But I'm here for those who don't have, who are sick. We've hoped too much. Now we want deliverance. Over to you, Elder Andil, as you guide us before I come back in prayer. Oh, Sundesi, um, I mean, I just read, um, someone just, um, I am a very, <laughs> I cry easily. Someone just said um, they're tired of fighting hard. Someone says they don't have, um, uh, I'm going to switch off my video for a while. Pastor, all I'm saying is this, um, I'm so grateful that we, we worship a God who when he became man, it is recorded that he cried tears. Um, yes. I am so grateful that he, he demonstrated that life as we have to live it on earth and the pain that accompanies it is not as it should be. And I think that's sometimes what's missing in our conversations and our dialogue as Christians. We seem to try and sanitize the experience um, mm. and make it an unrealistic, <laughs> an unrealistic, um, an unrealistic experience. That frankly, when people look at us, they think, "No, you guys, you guys clearly don't understand." And yet, you're not calling us to be naive. You're, you're calling us to to God. And um, I'm going to read some of these things. We're going to go thematically again. There are people who um, are struggling because they're, they're giving up. Someone says they're tired of fighting. Someone is seeking divine deliverance. Uh, yeah. Someone is saying that um, yeah, someone's feeling like a joke, Pastor. Mm -hmm. That life is just being a joke. I'm the joke. I'm the punchline in this in this joke called life. Mm -hmm. Some people are, I mean, children are coming up very, very often. Children who, like you've said, have had to watch their families disintegrate. And so they have no hope. They, yes. they can't imagine themselves being married or living happily there. There's another theme of divorced uh, individuals who are raising children alone. Mm. So this is again dashed hopes, right? Yes. Um, then there's the hopes. Here's someone asking us to pray for their daughter who, who needs to go back to school. Studying in South Africa, recently told school has been postponed due to COVID-19 virus. Mm. So Pastor, I think the theme here is, and I think people are resonating with this idea that you're sharing this uh, biblical notion that um, God is calling us to hope. Um, it's not it's not an empty hope. It's not it's not positive vibes. It is hope in God and all He has promised. And um, there are marriage problems. Um, churches are struggling um, with membership issues because of COVID. Again, the contract between church members and their churches and the congregations under strain. Yeah. 
Folks, before yeah. Pastor per- prays, I, I want you to know we are at the limit of our of our Zoom call. Uh, we can only accept 500 people. We've been bumping 49, 499, 500, 499, 500 for the last t- 15, 20 minutes. There's a live stream. We've shared the, the link to the live stream on, on YouTube. Please, please, please share what we are on to here with people who need it in your, in your families, in your networks. We, 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 are, we are inviting you to, to, to invite other people to plug into the true life-giving power, the eternal hope, the enduring hope that is Jesus Christ, as Pastor uh, Ketelo has, has, has presented in this evening. Pastor, I'll invite you to pray now. But please, uh, even as he prays, um, visit the chat box. Visit the chat box and, and make it your burden to lift up your prayers, but the prayers of those around us um, to the Lord in prayer, even as we pray. And then keep them coming. And inter- a prayer for intervention, Pastor. Someone is saying, intervene in my life, Lord. Make something of my life. Pastor, please pray for us. And thank you. <clears throat> We're going to pray now. Mm-hmm. And I'm being very specific, dear saints who are listening right now. The message that God gave me this evening is a message that clearly says He intervenes immediately for those cases where His children just cannot go on anymore. That is why I raised the story of Job, I raised Moses, people who came to God and said to Him, I can't. I can't anymore. I I don't have. I don't have the theological understanding. I don't have the explanations. I don't have, I've listened to the sermons. Now where I am, I don't want to be preached to. I want to be brought out of this situation. And this evening I've come to tell you that God is going to do exactly just that. That is what we are going to pray for. That you be brought out. That I be brought out of the things which we just cannot endure anymore. There are things that we still have strength to walk with God for and keep praying about. But there are also things where We've reached rock bottom and our only option is to be pulled out. And that is what I'm praying for this evening. I need you to hear me very well because I'm not good with general prayers. I'm not that kind of a minister. I'm praying specifically for those who want to be delivered immediately because they've been fighting. They've been praying and nothing has been happening. And they just want to say, I don't have the strength. That's our intervention tonight. Let's pray together. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, God in the highest, we thank you for your word. Your word is like a two-edged sword. Firstly, I thank you for the strength you gave us in times past to trust you and keep fighting. Some of the problems that we are bringing before your throne of grace this evening started four years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And in all those years, your children never gave up. They stayed faithful as much as any mortal could. They trusted you and you did not fail them. You saw them through. You gave us strength to survive in the midst of those problems. The problems never ended, but you kept us going. And we are grateful for that. We lift your name up, almighty God, for your faithfulness in those previous years of carrying the burden. Some of us were born in poverty, and yet, Heavenly Father, we can come before your throne of grace this evening and say thank you. Though the poverty never ended, we did not perish, and we thank you that you gave us, our parents, those who raised us, the faith to endure while you kept us in the midst of the storm. 
Some have been married for years, but in those years, there's been no joy. It has been painful. Hey, almighty God, they stayed because they trusted your word, because they knew that divorce is an abomination to you. Some stayed because their children needed stability. But Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to come and say to you, thank you for that strength first. Thank you. It kept us going. Some have been sick. For the past 10 years, 6 years, 9 years, 20 years, there are people in this group who have not known a single night without pain for more than a decade now. There are people in this group who have been married for years and they have no children. And their marriages are sinking because of that. They have prayed and you have sustained them. They have been the laughing stock of relatives and in-laws. And you gave strength to endure in those seasons. And we are grateful for that strength. There are people here whose children have been hooked in drugs, whose brothers and sisters, whose mothers and fathers have been hooked on witchcraft who have been hooked on alcoholism, and you've kept them. You've kept them, dear God, for years. You've kept them. You've preserved their lives from the pit of death, as David says. However, Father, this evening, we've come now standing on the premise of Proverbs 13, 12, and we've come to say, now the heart is sick. Now the heart is sick, almighty God. We don't have enough to go on. We don't have enough to make it. For some, a day would be too long. For some, a year would be too long. Some are suicidal, and the world doesn't understand how they got there. Some are contemplating drugs. Some are contemplating alcohol because they are now looking for a way to relieve themselves because hope has hoped to the end. And Father, I call upon your name the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. That for those of us this evening who are at that crossroad, remember us, almighty God, and in the name of Jesus Christ, the Holy Nazarene, this very evening, act to deliver us. Father, we seek no sermons anymore. We do not seek an ability to go on for another week or another year. We seek an end. We call for an end in the name of Jesus. Father, not by the merits of our own struggles, not by the endurance of our strength, but by the name and the blood of Jesus, our Savior. We are pleading with you this evening, bring our suffering to an end. Bring it to an end, Holy Father. Deliver your children. Come through for us. Reach out your hand as you did to Peter and pull us out as we are drowning. Someone out there, someone out there has already decided that this is their final year as a Christian. Some are saying, we can't give God ultimatums. My Bible disagrees. Moses did say to you, if you will not go with us, we are going nowhere. And you did not strike him with lightning. Instead, you blessed him with your presence. So we know that you are a God who hears when your children have reached the uttermost. Come through. Come through, almighty God. Come through this evening. Come through in the name of Jesus. Come through in the blood of Jesus. Come through for the sake of the life of Jesus. Come through for your name's sake. Come through for your kingdom's sake. Let your name be glorified in the interventions you will issue for us tonight. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine 
to him who is able to present us faultless and blameless before the throne of grace, to the only true God, invisible and incorruptible, be honor and glory as you deliver us, your children, this evening we have prayed. Amen.